Um, so guys, this is going to be relatively quick and dirty. I actually teach a three-day conference on this stuff. Um, so narrowing that down to 45 minutes is um, a lot. So I'm trying to give you guys some ideas that then you can explore further because the bright side is most of you are millennials. So you're good at figuring this stuff, stuff out once you have the idea. Um, plus today as an additional component that we're all experiencing right now, virtual conferences. So I think most of us are on virtual didactics right now. My, uh, my university still is. So I'm going to address some of how to build that in um, because usually a huge part of what we do is small groups in person really staying engaged and it gets harder once you start being on Zoom. Um, so passive learning is what we were all used to in college. You sit there, someone talks at you. We don't like this. Um, so we're gonna try to avoid that. It's a little bit, you wanna be very careful because with virtual conferences, that's the easiest thing. The easiest thing is just get a lecture and have them talk at your residence, but you're not gonna keep them engaged for five hours. So it, some things inevitably are gonna be lectures, but try to avoid it. Um, so active learning is better. So small groups, we're gonna talk about TBLs. We're gonna talk about other ways you can do that even when you're virtual or online. So today we're gonna talk, describe the ways to encourage active learning during didactics. We're gonna participate in and understand some components of a team-based learning session. We're gonna review options for audience response systems. We're gonna list other options for small group learning and games, as well as some other resources. And then I'm going to very briefly review some slide design concepts with you guys. This entire slideshow is almost 200 slides long. I'll just work with Matt and we'll make it um, accessible to you guys because the last 150 slides are really just a bunch of different examples that you can just steal. That's the best way to slide design take something someone else did and reuse it. There's no reason um, to reinvent the wheel every other day. So briefly, let's talk a little bit about virtual didactics. So you guys are probably in your residency using something of this. I think Zoom is the most common, so we're gonna talk about that really briefly. Uh, there's Microsoft Teams, there's GoToMeeting, uh, Google Hangouts, if you don't have another option, works pretty well for small groups. And then Adobe Connect is another one that people have used. So in case some of the chiefs here haven't been on the hosting side of Zoom, I just wanted to review uh, this really quickly. So this is what you guys are used to. This is when no one else is in your meeting. This is just like the baseline. Um, when you go to the bottom, you've got um, all these different settings where you can look at the number of participants you have. If one of your residents forgets to mute during a lecture, if you're the host, you can actually mute them. So I find this is a problem fairly often. I hear screaming kids in the background, someone doesn't realize you can mute them. And then chat. I've got the chat open if you guys have questions, just pause me. But chat's great for asking questions in the middle, keeping a discussion going. For sharing your screen, you can just share everything, which would be your entire screen, your entire desktop. Or there's a couple of different options. So if you go to the advanced sharing uh, session um, options, which is the middle, uh, oh, sorry, you can also just share different windows. So your entire Microsoft, my entire calendar, whatever I wanna share with you guys. I use the advanced, so I just share a portion of my screen. That way I can actually still see the chat, I can still see the other participants, I can see my residents. Uh, we actually have all of our residents keep their video on. If you guys are gonna continue doing virtual didactics, I actually recommend that. It adds a little bit to the, um, requirement of making sure everyone's actually paying attention, but it also really helps with engagement. And then lastly is breakout rooms. So on the bottom right side, if you're the host, you have breakout rooms. So you can tell it how many rooms you want, and then you can assign your residents. So when I was recording this, I didn't have anyone in the room with me, but you can either have it just do it randomly and it'll break it up into however many rooms you want with however many participants, or I typically will manually assign it. That way I can break up my first, second, third years, okay? So just a couple of quick things on the best ways to use Zoom. This is really important. You want to be using um, small group learning, even though a lot of us are in virtual didactics. So cookies and tea-based learning. So usually we would do this uh, in groups. It's gonna be a little harder today because we're not gonna be able to break 69 of you guys up into small groups without going real slow. So team-based learning has several different components. We're gonna go through all of them real quick. The first is some sort of learning responsible content. This actually isn't essential. It's a um, considered an essential part of standard team-based learning, but we're residents. Uh, you guys are residents. I teach residents. You guys are very busy. Sometimes it's hard to have my residents do something in advance before residency, uh, before didactic. Um, so this could be something like a video, a YouTube video or something that you watch together at the beginning of conference. It could be just an article that they have access to that you ask them to read before or you just give it to them. So in this case, um, I'm giving you guys an article here. 
So I would like, I'm gonna put it in the chat. I just want you guys to open this because I want you to have access to it while we are doing um, the rest of this. So if you guys could open the link that I just put in the chat for you. Um, if you're having a hard time opening the link, sometimes Zoom gets ticked off. Um, you can go ahead and just Google the science of baking cookies. It's the first result. So that would be your learner responsive content. So I have the option of doing III, which is individualized interactive instruction, which you can do 20% of your resident didactics, which is just asynchronous learning. Right now that's a little gray and a lot of residencies are doing more than that, but um, ACGME without COVID allows for 20%. So you could say they're gonna spend an hour reading uh, that article and you can actually shorten your didactics by that. If you're gonna do that, I encourage you to do it that, this way with TBLs where you then incorporate it into the conference as pre-world learning. So the next thing, now that you guys have that uh, article, would be the IRAT or the individualized, the individual readiness assessment test. So if we were all in person, I would give you guys handouts and you would all get this little brief um, multiple choice question quiz. However, we're not. So we're gonna use Google Forms, which is just as good as having a piece of paper in a small group. Um, so there's a bit.ly here. Do you guys want to use that? It's bit.ly slash 3COU15L. All right, oops. I guess I've got to put the HTTP. So if everyone could open that real quick. And using the article, spend just a couple of minutes. We're, like I said, we're going to be quick and dirty, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on this. But if you guys can all open that and just use the form a minute. Start answering the questions. Use the article that you have and start answering the questions in this Google form. So it should look like this. And all of those multiple choice test. Now, if I wanted to, if I wanted to track each of you, I could have a section for name. And as the owner of the Google form, I can actually go in and look at how all my residents did if I wanted to see, did they actually read the article? Or are they really struggling with this concept? Um, and so as the individual readiness assessment test, you guys would just kind of look at the article and answer all these questions. And yes, I know it's a little silly to learn about baking cookies, but we pick something that you guys don't know about. So it's a little easier to see how, how you learn with this. So we'll go ahead and move forward. So the next thing that we would do would be what's called the group readiness assessment test. So after you guys take the individual readiness assessment test alone, I would break you up into groups. If I were on Zoom, I would use the breakout room option that I just showed you guys and I would break you up into groups that way and I would have you work together and discuss, you know, maybe person A thought the answer was A, but person B thought the answer was C. And then you guys discuss, come up with an answer that you agree upon. If we were in person, I would use scratch off stickers. So this is um, something you can order on Amazon. It, they're literally just called scratch off stickers. And so you put them over the answers here. And then as they work for, together in a group, they try to scratch off the one that they think is the correct answer. And if it's right, there'll be a little star. If it's wrong, there won't be. Um, so that's what's called an IFAD, an Intermediate Achievement Assessment Test. So I can run a room of 100 people if I have to. And every single group still gets immediate feedback on whether they were right on that question or wrong. And then when we're done, I can debrief and answer any issues, address any questions, any issues. However, you guys can all work in small groups with just one instructor. So this is a really easy thing for you guys to do as chiefs when you're running a larger residency. Now, we're on virtual, so we can't do that. So instead, we're gonna use Google Forms. So this one, I really want you guys to work, open up and check out. The last one was just seven questions, multiple choice style. This is kind of a choose your own adventure style Google form. It's really easy to do. I highly recommend you try it. It's a fairly engaging way to um, work your residents through questions. So as you work through this one, 
if you were in a group, you would discuss the answer, but you guys can just use your same answers from your IRAT. So flour helps the cookie take, uh, hold its shape, change its consistency. What will happen if you add more flour? Um, it will be crisper and thicker. Correct. And it takes me here. Now, if I was wrong, it would tell me I'm wrong, try again, and it would bounce me back to the same question. So when I'm right, it takes me on to the next question. And same thing here. Uh, if I'm wrong, it'll tell me I'm wrong and it'll bounce me back to that question again to try again. So it's the same concept as the scratch off sticker GRAP. You still get immediate feedback on whether you're right or wrong. So the way we're using these for TBLs in our residency is they work in a group and they're working through this. Usually just once, in the, once you're in the breakout room, every breakout room can share a screen. So one resident will share their screen and they start working through this together discussing each question and as you go through if you get them right it lets you move on to the next question um, so this is fairly easy to make it turns into about 30 sections because each wrong answer has to have its own section um, but working with the Google Forms is actually very easy so I strongly recommend you guys give that a shot um, for a variety of things and we'll talk about some of the games you can do so the best way to do this what I would did just FYI is you do this go to section based on answer so that's how it's bouncing you back and forth, depending on whether you get the right answer or not. It's really easy to do, I swear. All right, group application exercise is the last component of a TBL. So the group application exercise is when you actually apply the knowledge. So we read the learner responsible content, we worked through some basic questions to test our knowledge in the IRAT and the GRAT, but the group application exercise is where we're gonna apply that knowledge. So in this case, it's a little bit silly. It's a cookie recipe and the questions ask you ways that you can edit the cookies recipe to make certain changes. Uh, for most medical TBLs, this is gonna be cases. So maybe you're doing an asthmatic TBL and it's a case on you know, a patient who's crumping, they're hypoxic, what's the first step? What meds would you give? At what point would you, intubate? Would you try BiPAP? Why or why not? And so application exercises like that, um, which again, can be done with Google Forms. So in this case, if you guys wanna try this link, um, it just allows long answer texts. So same concept, but lets me kind of track what the residents are doing um, and still lets me incorporate a TBL without having handouts and things like that since we were virtual. Any questions on the TBL guys? All right. So all the components, your learner responsible content, again, kind of optional or can be done during class, an IRAT, a GRAT, and a group application exercise. TBLs take some time to set up, but they're very reusable. And I'll talk to you guys about a couple resources where you can grab them, uh, ready-made ones or ones to slightly edit for your needs. Uh, modified TBLs, you can do these in a lot of different ways. So I just wanna show you guys one other example. So this is an ITBL, a red ITBL that we have. So instead of the multiple choice question that I just showed you guys with the cookie one, this one, I would just put this up on PowerPoint and there would be a list of a bunch of questions like closure or narrowing of the anterior chamber angle causing elevated intraocular pressure and eventual optic nerve damage. And your job would be to match that with one of these letters here. And in this case, the answer is H, acute angle glaucoma. All right, so there, you can do matching, you can do a lot of different things with TBLs. So let's talk about audience response systems. So audience response systems are ways to engage learners. And again, this works very well virtually or in person. Um, here's some options that we find are a little bit better than others. So Poll Everywhere has a free option um, for up to 40 people. Past that, a lot of our universities already have subscriptions that you can use. There's Slido, there's Socrative. Kahoot is one of our favorites, works really well, free, and then Mentimeter. Um, so we're gonna talk about Poll Everywhere and Kahoot today. Um, so uses, you can use it to solidify knowledge, you can check understanding. People are often hesitant to raise their hands and say, no, I don't understand the TBL, what's your point? Um, so this way, you can give everyone an opportunity to anonymously ask that. Um, you can also objectively assess that and to see if everyone has the correct answer. And a lot of them like Hoot, if you have them put their name in first, you can actually track later whether they did well, whether they were correct or not, or if people were really struggling. Uh, you can use them for team co competitions. And as I said, you can use it in place of hand raising. So 
really quickly, I would like you guys to join me on Poll Everywhere. We're going to try, I'm just gonna show you guys a few of the things that Poll Everywhere can do. So if you wanna do it via text, then you can just text UCIEM to 22333. Or easier, since most of you are probably on your computers, you can just go to www.pollev.com slash UCIEM. So if everyone wants to join me there real quick. And once you're there, so this is one of the easiest ways you can use Poll Everywhere. So what's everyone's favorite ice cream flavor? And you guys should all see the different options on your screen and you can pick them. And we can see what everyone's favorite. Oh, mint chocolate chip is winning by far. But we do have some rainbow sherbet today, so that's good. They're usually left alone. No one loves vanilla. This is an interesting group. All right, um, so this is one way to do it. So obviously ice cream is a little silly, but I could ask, I could give a case and ask what does everyone think what the diagnosis is? And then I can get a good idea of what everyone's understanding is and what the majority of the group thinks. Um, so this is one of the types of poll that Poll Everywhere will do. Um, the next one is kind of a fill in the blank. So what's your favorite pizza topping? And now you can type anything you want. Cheese. Always a good idea. And so this could also be used for, does anyone have any questions? If you've got a quiet group, if you've got a group of interns that you're afraid aren't gonna speak up, you could just let them ask questions this way that you can follow them up. Mushrooms, olives, no meat lovers here, huh? All right, lots of vegetarians, I get it. Um, see, I'm, I'm more of a, there we go, there's some bacon. I'm a sausage pepperoni girl. All right, so that's another way you can do it. So very open-ended and it's just gonna keep adding the answers here. Um, another way is you can actually use pictures instead of questions for that multiple choice. So which one of these patients appears to have hyperthyroidism? And so far, everyone seems to think C, couple Bs, for the most part Cs. So yeah, so you can throw pictures in there for case questions. Um, or I can use a picture for the question. So there's an EKG up at the top. Where's the lesion? So it's a little bit small, but um, there's basically ST elevations everywhere, mostly in the lateral leads, but yep. So impressive, huge ST elevations all through the lateral leads like that, probably an LAD occlusion. Perfect. All right, so that's Poll Everywhere. It's very easy to use. Um, like I said, we'll go, we'll compare and contrast, but up, for four, up to 40 residents you could do for free. Um, so depending on the size of your conference and how many residents you have at a given time, a lot of residencies, that would be perfect. They could use the free version. Um, now we're going to play it. All right. All right. So you guys are going to go to kahoot.it. And you're going to type in that game pin. And then it's going to ask you for a username. And we're going to play a game. Dominator. Nice. You can use emojis. My residents like using emojis. Uh, if you try something dirty, it will block you out and it will give you another name and it will tell you you're bad. Um, because the reason it does that, FYI, is because this was made for kindergartners. Uh, I think that's part of why it works so well for emergency medicine physicians who are basically kindergartners. Um, so we use this probably weekly on my residence for various, um, we'll use it for respiratory board review, we'll use it for trauma board review, any type of board review, we'll use it for our reading quizzes, um, we'll use it for closing out a lecture to see if anyone has any issues and how well everyone understands things. We use this very frequently. I'll give you guys another 30 seconds to get in.
All right, we've got 24 players. Here we go, guys. Speed and accuracy. So what's the capital of this state? Oh, very split there, but Montpelier is correct, is Vermont. All right, all of us, uh, too many Californian people here who aren't good at geography, obviously. <laughs> all right, Sunny Day is in the lead. All right, next one, what movie is this? These are OR scrubs. Oh, I was supposed to say, oh, are they? My internet is not handling Zoom and YouTube video as well. Rushmore. All righty. Sunny day. Oh, sunny day still in the lead. All righty, what country is this? We did our, look, we did our United States geography, now it's time for international geography. Ah, oh, good, most people answered Belgium, that is correct. Uh, oh, Sunny Day dropped a spot. Superfly is now winning. All right, who is this? Emma Stone. Ah, look at you guys. All righty. Superfly is still in the lead. What sport is this? I notice, guys, there's a timer here, but also once everyone answers, it'll stop. All right, curling. That is correct. Superfly is still in the lead. And last one, what band is this? Europe. All righty, who won? MJS, third place, second place, sunny day. And Superfly is still in the lead. Congratulations, whoever Superfly is. All right. Um, so that's Kahoot, guys. You've got uh, a lot of options with it. So pictures as questions, pictures as answers, videos in the question. Um, you can actually add slides between questions now so that you can have a question, have an answer, and then have a slide that discusses it. Um, so you could do almost an entire review lecture with just Kahoot. And it's a little bit more engaging. It keeps everyone going. It's competitive. My residents get very competitive about it. Um, they all have the app because it's faster than just using the internet. Um, another thing, again, if you guys do asynchronous learning, you've got two options when you're playing the Kahoot. So if you're going to do asynchronous learning, you could actually just have the residents go through it themselves. And again, that could include explanatory slides. Um, so highly recommend you guys play with Kahoot a little bit and um, practice it a bit and figure it out. So here, just this just kind of compares the different options. So like I said before, Poll Everywhere, it's free for up to 40 people. Um, so if you don't often have more than 40 residents attending your conferences, that'll probably work for you. So small to medium-sized residencies, that'll work for you. Larger residencies, not so much. Um, 
past that, it starts getting really expensive. So unless you're a university, you're probably not going to use it. Slido's okay. And it's free up to a thousand. So that's going to work for most residencies. Kahoot is free. There are some paid options. They're actually still really cheap. It's a hundred bucks a year and it lets you make folders and have a few more options as far as organizing things. Um, so we have it, but it's certainly not necessary. Using the free one is fine. Socrative works pretty well up to 50 people and then Mentimeter, um, there is no limit, uh, but you can, uh, there's a question limit, not a limit on the number of people you can use. Um, so anyway, so those are your different options. This will be in the slideshow for those of you who compare. Yay, Bell liked Kahoot. Kahoot's great. I know it seems very, very childish and it is, um, but we're all children at heart. All right, so other engaging activities. We're gonna talk a little about small groups, uh, games and escape rooms. So small group learning is typically gonna be case-based. Um, it's fairly easy to create. You just need a bunch of questions. Um, so cases with questions to guide the discussion. You can't just give them cases and expect them to know what to do. You need to direct them, like what is the next best step? Why or why wouldn't we wanna intubate this patient? What medications would you try first? Why would you use terbutaline instead of epinephrine or vice versa? So you have to have something to guide it. Um, and again, these can be self-paced if you have enough questions or you can have faculty uh, facilitators or chief residents, senior resident facilitators that work in the small groups. Um, smaller is better. We try to keep our groups usually right around five. So one or two, two about two people per cl class level. Um, you can go bigger than that. It just starts getting hard. You start losing that um, engagement and participation. Um, games and Sims this is a little harder right now, given that we're not allowed to meet in person. Um, we are we're actually re we are reopened for simulation as long as we don't have more than 10 people in a room recently. So we're just shoving all of our games into our sim day because we still get to meet in person. So the disaster triage exercise was an exercise that we did outside. Uh, one of our chief residents put together an entire exercise with over 40 cases um, of different patients after a um, multi-casualty incident. And you had to work through all of them and properly um, uh, triage each patient, decide if they were black, red, yellow, or green. Um, they had to, if they were going to the OR, the residents actually had to play a game of um, operation to clear the OR. So they actually had to pull out different um, organs before they were allowed to clear that OR and let another patient in. Uh, they also um, had walkie-talkies so they could talk to different, different grounds when trying to figure out how best to orient that. Um, homemade task trainers work really well. If you don't have a sim center with um, $20,000 test tube trays, there's, if you Google, there's almost any kind of task trainer you could want that you can make on your own for, you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 bucks, depending on what it is. Uh, this video in the bottom right corner is a um, Perry Morgan C-section one that we made. So it, all it was, was it's a turkey um, container, like a turkey pat pan. And you put the baby in a bag with fluid, you put all that together, you cover it with fake skin that was made with um, dragon skin um, that you can order online. And they had to cut it, cut the baby out. Um, the picture of her on the ground is when she realized that the trauma patient who was coding was pregnant. They were gonna have to do a perimortem. Um, works really well, a little messy. We now do it outside because we made a big mess at the trauma center. Um, so other options for small group learning, especially now in virtual times, um, so these are some examples and we I'll click through a couple of them with you guys. Uh, let me give you, let me actually just copy the links into the chat for you guys. Um, and actually you guys are welcome to kind of borrow these. I'm not sure all the images are copyright free because these were intended for us only, but you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me. Um, so one of these first ones, these are all choose your own adventure. So sort of like the TBL that I showed you guys, um, but different. So, there we go. All right, so this one, uh, one of our, I can't take credit, one of our amazing fellows, John Smart made this. Um, so it's cruise ship quarantine and arms race. Um, so it is a zombie apocalypse on a cruise ship and all of the learning points are upper extremity orthopedic injuries. Um, so as you go through, he gives you the instructions here, so it's almost completely self-contained. We broke everyone up into breakout rooms on Zoom. 
And basically you go through and it gives you different stories. Here's what's going on. Day four of a zombie apocalypse. You're stuck on a cruise ship. Where are you gonna go? And it gives you different options. So do you wanna go left? Do you wanna go right? And as you make different options, oh, you died. No, you got punched, you punched someone in the mouth. And so here's the fight bite picture. What's the first line of antibiotics? So you would pick your, op your options and we go augmenting. And it gives you your learning point about your fight bite and it lets you continue on your adventure. Um, so this specific one had five different pathways and they had to find all five different endings and it spelled out a word. And the first group to spell out the complete word, one. Um, and only one of the pathways did you live, but you had to find all five pathways. Um, so it's just a different way to kind of use a game that's online now that we can't be in person. Um, take some time. It's not hard to use Google Forms, but when you start getting to 100 sections on Google Forms, it slows down. Um, so it takes a little bit of time, but recommend you guys check it out. Another way that we've, we used it, we did it for a, Nash, um, a neonatal resuscitation uh, program review. And so it's just a bunch of cases and it's just very repetitive going through the steps of NRP over and over and over again. Like what's the first thing you go through? You do term tome breathing or cyanosis. And so it gives you the answer. It gives you some information. So this allows me to have multiple groups playing a game working through a Google form. And I, as the, when I'm the host, I can bounce into the different rooms to make sure that no one's having any issues. But because the learning points are built into the Google form, I don't have to be everywhere. I can break everyone up into groups and I don't need a facilitator for each group. The Google form is the facilitator and then might have a 15 minute debrief at the end. So I really recommend you guys check out Google forms and play with it a little bit. Um, it's actually a really uh, easy, uh, thing to use. It just takes some time. Alrighty. So other options. Escape rooms. So escape rooms, uh, hopefully everyone done escape room, like a normal, like actual commercial escape room. Yeah. Most people, um, they're fun. Uh, so we've taken that and we just use learning points. So instead of locking people in a room, when we're in person, we use most of the offices in our um, building and each one is a different room and each one has different questions. So this is a game that they play. So basically, if you look down here in the right corner, color which ones have antidotes. It's a bunch of toxicology, um, it's a bunch of tox and they have to color the ones that have an antidote. It's going to match one of these uh, shapes on the wall. They flip it over, they use the black light. If they're right, it tells them where to go, what room to go to next. If they're wrong, it tells them to try again. Um, and that way, all the residents are working through a different room. We can have five or six groups. And as long as they're split, separated out a little bit, they don't start running into each other. There's a bunch of different games you can do this. And again, I'll show you guys some examples, but basically you just have different questions or problems or things like this, where it's a, it's a pattern recognition um, and have the residents work through them on a given topic. So we've done them for trauma and respiratory and psych. And it's kind of a neat way to get a bunch of different topics all into one. Um, oh yeah, patient safety in the hospital. Those are fun ones. We actually do one also for like orienting them to the ER where they have to go around and um, I guess it's more, it's partial safe room, part scavenger hunt and they're finding different people. So now that we're all virtual, how do we do this? Well, again, have to give full credit to my, um, my fellow John Smart is amazing. So he made the whisper killer. <laughs> So all this is the giant PDF. Um, sorry, let me put the bit.ly back up, guys. Sorry, I realized I did not leave that up long enough for you. Let me just I'm gonna copy it into the chat for you. There, now everyone can just grab the link. Um, so he made this elaborate escape room. We find that our residents tend to um, Sometimes we think things are gonna be hard and it's way too easy on them. So with having an hour and a half, he decided to make it really hard. He overshot a little bit. If you guys try to work for this later, we're not, we don't have time now. Um, it's incredibly frustrating, it's really hard. Um, so basically he's got instructions and then it starts like an escape room or like the little murder boxes. If anyone's ever bought, bought the little murder boxes and it's got instructions. Here's this letter from the FBI about the whisper th thief and then it goes through and it's got a bunch of different questions. It uses QR codes. 
and they have to work through all of them and they are ultimately medical questions. So as they go through each of these QRs, it's gonna take them into a bunch of medical questions about that guy. And they have to answer those questions to get more clues and ultimately decide who the killer is. So ultimately it's a mix of kind of a murder box, but there's a bunch of medical questions involved. Um, this took him some time. I mean, he probably put 30 hours into building this out, but once you make a library of these, you can just keep reusing them every three or four years, depending on your residency. Um, so again, you don't have to be in person to make these escape rooms work. You just have to have it and you have to have um, enough information. And if for us, we broke them out into breakout rooms for this. And then John jumped from room to room so he could help the groups that were stuck. Um, so that's the way you can do a virtual escape room, just a very long PDF with QR codes that give you the answer or tell you whether you're right or wrong. Again, that's that immediate feedback part where I don't have to be in every room, but technology gives them the answer. Um, so the golden rule for games. Games are fun. You have to pick your objectives first. And this is something that a lot of people who are first using this um, struggle with because you're like, I want to play this game. Uh, and you start going off on a tangent and focusing on the game part and you miss what your learning objectives were supposed to be. So just be very, very cautious. If you want, games should be played because it's the best way to teach something. Because board review is boring, so making it a kahoot where it's competitive helps engage people. You shouldn't play a game just for the sake of playing a game. Um, so usually we have a list of all the topics we need to cover and when we come up with something that we're like, this sounds like the worst lecture ever, like electrolytes electrolytes is just not going to be fun to teach no matter what we have it as a game it's a matching game with a bunch of images and cases and treatments and so um that's usually when we end up with games is when there's no better way to teach it and we think we can make it into a good game but again start with your objectives then determine whether it's a game a competition a sim how to best meet those objectives um just be very very cautious about making games for the sake of making games um, I, it was on the slide earlier, but I'd forgotten to mention it. We did a neuro charades once because learning neuroanatomy is boring and it's a terrible lecture and no one wants to listen to that. So we actually gave them all of the classic strokes and they had to know what the symptoms would be just based on the type of stroke and where it was going to affect it. And they had to act it out and then their group had to guess. Um, it was the most hilarious thing ever, and it actually worked really well for them to rem remember, like what an MCA stroke is, or what a um, what a posterior circulation stroke would be. Um, but it was also very, very entertaining. So sometimes you just entertain yourself when you're making these things, but mostly you're trying to make sure you're meeting your learning objectives. Um, so some resources: Meted Portal and JetyM have a lot of TBLs, Sims, games, things like that. So it's a place to start. Um, you guys are chief residents; you don't have all the time in the world. I try to encourage my chiefs, um, they each do four blocks per year, and I try to make them do one big thing each block. So four months, four times a year, they have to make a game or a Kahoot or something. Um, so I'd really encourage you guys to do that. Um, I mean, I know some residencies, the chiefs are making almost all the didactics. When you start getting into that, no one can blame you. You're gonna have lots of lectures, but try to do one game per block that you're planning or one game for, per didactic that you're planning, depending on how elaborate it is, because again, a lot of these, just like a good lecture, it'll take 10 hours to make a really good TBL. But this is a place to start where you can just borrow a bunch of resources. All right, didactic planning. Just some food for thought. Always come up with your schedule prepared in advance. I strongly recommend against hour-long lectures. Adults can't pay attention that long. Children can't either. Um, so 30 to 45 minutes is really the better um, option. So aim for like a 45 minute, we have 45 minute blocks for each of our lectures and then an hour for m, &M. And if something is a game or a TBL and it's gonna take longer, we give it two 45 minute blocks, which gives it an hour and a half. Um, this also allows you to kind of cut down on your outside lecturers. Um, I know sometimes we invite a neurologist or someone to give a talk and they don't quite make it EM focused and it gets a little, um, Can you guys still see my screen? It says it's paused. You guys can still see it, right? Okay, all right, it says didactic planning, we're good. It's not stuck on the same thing, okay. Thanks guys, sorry. I just realized it's yellow and it's flashing at me. And, all right, anyway, so I highly recommend you guys aim for 45 minute time slots, an hour and a half if you um, have something that's bigger in a game. 
and otherwise um, really cut your lectures down. Just be very clear with them. It's not an hour time slot. We'd really like you to do 45 minutes. If you're inviting a non-EM person, I suggest you give them the objectives. They won't always stick with it, but be like, hey, we really want to learn about your contacting ophthalmologist. Can't miss diagnoses in the ER and when we have to call you in the middle of the night. And they should be happy to teach you those things because they don't want to get called in the middle of the night. Um, so if you're inviting someone who's non-EM, go ahead and give them those objectives and tell, ask them, you know, can you give me a lecture on this? All right, so any questions on learning engagement, the TBL stuff, games? All right, so I'm going to go through slide design um, very quickly. We only have a few more minutes. Um, so for images and slides, uh, for slides, this is a color scheme gen generator. It's called Coolers. Be careful, it's a rabbit hole. If you start down it, you may never end leave. You'll just start finding color schemes you like and you'll get very, very stuck. Um, but if you are someone who has a hard time coming up, you don't want to use the traditional PowerPoint template, but you want something different, Coolers will give you color schemes and then you can actually just pull those colors directly into your PowerPoint or your Keynote and use them. Um, Google Images, if you need images, uh, make sure that you go Google Images, you go under Tools and you select the large images. This will make sure that they're big enough that they're not gonna be grainy for your lectures. Seems basic, but um, it looks very, very uh, amateur to have images that are too small. Um, usage rights. If you're giving a lecture in your own residency, this probably matters less. When you're giving lectures on a larger scale, like here, you need to make sure all your images are your own or cop copyright free. So under images, under tools, you select usage rights and you can use labeled for non-commercial reuse. Um, Slideology, if you're really interested in slide design, this is the best book. It's by Nancy Duarte. They run a lot of conferences and um, lectures on how to make lectures, um, but it's just a great book on the concept of slide design, what to focus on, uh, things like that. So this is one of their biggest points when you're trying to do emphasis, so we all know that a single slide with just a bunch of words doesn't really help. You want to minimize words, but if you are going to have words and you're going to emphasize something, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can do it with size, shade, color, proximity, just pull the words out. Um, so a couple different examples. These are the, the words are either bigger or they're pulled separate or they're put in the middle. Uh, for data, make sure that you don't just have a chart that no one knows the purpose because the first chart on the left i don't know what the point is is the point that in quarter three and four we rose or is the point that quarter two was the lowest i don't know um so if my point is that quarter two was the lowest that was our low point i need to point that out on my slide toolbox for keynote or microsoft or ms office are both um applications that allow you to use there's logos there's um different icons, there's different images, there's different charts you can use. Again, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. Once you start, you may never get out of it, um, but super fun to use, a lot of great options. So highly recommend you look into it if you're gonna be making a lot of slides this year. Um, also, if you have a Mac, I highly recommend you convert over to Keynote if you haven't already. Um, so it's a little bit of a learning curve, but it just has more options. It's just a little bit more user-friendly if you're already used to a Mac. So if you have a Mac and you typically use PowerPoint, just convert over to Keynote now. Uh, there's eDraw for Windows, which is very similar. Um, so again, just gives you a bunch of icons, different images, different charts that you can edit. Pictochart um, allows you to make kind of infographic style things. They do have educational pricing. So if you're going to be making a bunch of different charts and a bunch of images, you can try that. Um, Canva gives you options on um, it's a bunch of templates. So it's a bunch of Keynote and PowerPoint templates that give you a background and a color scheme right off the bat. So you can kind of look through it. Again, a bit of a rabbit hole when you start it. There's a lot of options and it gets really fun to kind of dig through. All right, so this is what I call the slide off. I'm just going to show you guys a couple different ways that different people um, did some very common slides that we all have to do. Uh, I do not cre take credit for this. These are some of my colleagues um, who made these. Um, so at least Ray, Beth Runcy, Warren Weekman, and Kevin King were all involved in the making of these slides. So objectives, we all make objective slides. All of your lectures should probably have objective slides. This is the traditional objective slide, boring. How can we make it better? You can use icons. You can change the color as you go through them and as you're discussing them. So again, I'm emphasizing the point I'm talking about. We're gonna learn general concepts in slide design. 
we're going to understand options for Keynote. And the color is changing and darkening out as I move on to the next one. Um, so this is more engaging than a list and not hard to make. And again, you guys will have these slides. You can just steal them. Uh, another option is same idea. It's just moving through and adding, changing the color and putting emphasis on the one that I'm talking about. All right, charts. We often have to do charts different. Um, this one's a start triage. So how can you make this a little more engaging, a little more interesting? So you can make it larger, change the colors, and this one uses blocks to make it a little bit more easier on the eyes. So are they walking, are they spontaneously breathing? And then it pulls you over to the minor intermediate, either intermediate or delayed. So this is hard to look at on a slide. This is much easier to talk through if I was giving a lecture. Um, someone else did it this way, where they did it more like um, a big timeline. And so as you go through, are they breathing or not? What's their respiratory rate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so don't always just use the baseline, take a picture from a book, copy, take a screenshot from a document. There are better, prettier ways to make things uh, more engaging if you're giving a lecture. Um, basic border view. So this was literally a picture out of the black book um, on heat conduction. So this is one way to talk about heat conduction. So you're using images that are um, reflective of what we're trying to talk about. So radiation, evaporation, conduction, convection. Uh, you are, the blocks make it very easy for the learner to look from one concept to the other as you talk about them. As you talk about heat exhaustion, again, you've got an image in the back that is representative of what you're talking about. I'm using color, the purple here, uh, to emphasize th certain points. For hypothermia, same concept. I've got a picture in the background that's more representative. And then we go through the different concepts on what things to look for, what, are the t what temperatures. All right. And again, you're using size here. There's not a lot of color difference, but size is kind of bringing the eye to the different concepts we're going through. This was someone else doing the exact same thing, temperature-related illnesses. Um, so again, they just used colors instead of images. So red is very heat-related. It's going to help me as a learner remember that. And they give the different concepts they're going to go through. They really minimize the words and are just talking about what each concept is as short as possible. And then they actually used annotations to clarify any points. Uh, challenge four, M&Ms. We all have to do case presentations in M&Ms. So here's one way to do it. Give all your information. These are um, toolbox for keynote uh, icons. And in this case, they uh, gave them all the information, gave the vitals for the physical exam. You can use a little icon, person icon, which again, from toolbox for keynote and give all the relevant physical exam information. Give the image that you need, any other results, or in this case, 23 year old belly pain. Again, they're just moving through their subjective, objective, physical exam, same idea. They're using some sort of picture to work through it. All right. Um, I think that is the end of my time, Matt. Should we do a Q&A now? And they, they'll have access to the rest of these. They can kind of go through them on their own. They really are just intended to be examples that they can swipe from. Um, again, doing actual slide design like very, very well would take a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that, that was awesome. I have already uh, been, uh, I've been stealing tons of ideas uh, that I'm going to be, uh, I can't wait. We already have, I think we've already literally put Neuro Charades on our timeline for next year's uh, July uh, calendar. Oh, it's great. You will love on that idea. It's I'm, one of my favorite didactics ever. <laughs> that is brilliant. Honestly, we were literally just talking about how do we teach the neuro exam better? Because we're never great at it. Uh, but man, a, a lecture on it would be boring. So this was phenomenal. Um, if no one else appreciated it, I'm sure all the chiefs did, but I certainly did too. Uh, and so uh, thank you so much. I'll give it a second just to see if anyone has any last lingering specific questions. I think, like you said, you went through an awful lot, but one of the great things about this slide set is it's, it's a great opportunity to take a breath, think about and mull over some of the ideas that you shared and then maybe come back to it um, because you've been kind enough to, uh, to share these with us and we'll try to put those online uh, with the recording of these, uh, these sessions as well. 
any big questions folks have. Do you have any, I, I guess I, I'll start us off. Uh, do you have any recommendations um, for, I think you gave some really nice ways to sort of avoid having too many facilitators, but for when your faculty are stretched a little bit thin uh, and, uh, you, you know, do you, ways to engage without a lot of humans? Yeah, that's when we really utilize our chiefs and our seniors or things like this, the Google Forms, where it's more time on my part or my APD's part or whoever made that content um, because I have to put all the learning points into that Google Form or into that Kahoot and have them kind of work through it themselves. But then I don't need a facilitator in each room because the learning points are built in. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Just start, play with Google Forms. It, it works very well. Um, Kahoot will also do it. Um, and like I showed you guys, you can do the asynchronous learning. And so you could put everyone in small groups and have them do asynchronous coots with the same concept. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things. Either utilize your chiefs or utilize something where the answers are built in as they go through each step, but they can't just rush through it. It's, it's in some way they have to answer before they move on, which Google Forms Kahoot will do. Um, those are the two main ones that we use. Great. One other question that comes to mind, um, you're clearly a forward thinking program director that really embraces technology and engaging learning platforms. Talk, could you maybe give the, uh, the chiefs some, like a leadership lesson if they were running up against a little bit of a more traditionalist program who had a very sort of strict um, curriculum, right? We, well, we read from Tip Nallies every week or, or more traditional uh, strict curriculum approach. Um, any thoughts on how to navigate that? Uh, for for these the soon to be changed. yeah I think those are a little trickier um, I think it kind of depends if you have a hands off program leadership you're you're kind of free reign um, I think the biggest thing would be make sure to point out your objectives explain to them what you're teaching um, if you've got someone who's hands on and they're very much no we're going to read Tentinelli and then we're going to have these lectures from these three people that we have every year um, I think there's plenty of shoot me an email. Um, it's probably at the end of the slide, but it's, I, I'm sure Matt can send it to you guys here. I'll put it in the chat, um, but feel free to email me guys. And I can send you a bunch of articles on why small group learning is better, why engaging learners is better, why lectures don't work. And hopefully you can bring that to your residency leadership and say, hey, you know, one hour a week or one and a half hours a week, we wanna try this. We just wanna start adding a little bit in. So you're gonna have to do baby steps if you're getting pushback. Um, I think if you're getting pushed back, you're also going to have to build it yourself. I don't think you're going to be able to anticipate your faculty helping you build it out. Um, but you may even want to steal someone's um, lecture. Be like, hey, we're going to take Dr. Smith's asthma lecture, but we're going to turn that into a more engaging game or some case reports that we can work through. And so I think you're just going to have to do baby steps, except that it's maybe going to be once a block or once a week that you can actually build that in. Um, but there's very good evidence for it. It's much better for learning. And I think if you just start baby steps and let them see how much better those lectures are reviewed compared to, or those didactics are reviewed compared to normal lectures, uh, you'll start getting a little bit better foothold. Yeah, I hear you. The change does not happen overnight in any program. And I think uh, that is something I think you all have probably heard actually is a really great probably ending point for us right now is a great theme that we've had throughout the, the day between Dr. Davis, Dr. Betham, and Dr. Tui's lectures um, is that, you know, you don't have to take the world on yourselves uh, and uh, as chiefs, but, you know, little changes stick. And when they are found to be effective and we're providing you with hopefully what is best practice, no program's perfect, but you have the opportunity to really hopefully have some really great, innovative, awesome ideas from truly the experts in the field um, about how to, you know, make your residency really just go from good to great. Uh, and so I really appreciate your taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule to share these ideas with us. Um, and we'll stick around for just maybe one more minute. If anyone else wants to unmute or have anything in the chat, uh, feel free. Uh, but otherwise, um, thank you so much, Dr. Tui. Thank you guys for having me. This is great.